the Teach Pitch podcast. We are very excited to be launching a series of interviews for Teach Pitch, a global community of tens of thousands of subscribers from over 205 countries who all have a desire to improve the state of education in this world. And for these interviews, we have selected a number of our subscribers who have achieved great things. And by great, I mean amazing. Think of former presidents, entrepreneurs, fashion designers, hospital builders, non-profit founders, authors, journalists, doctors, etc. And what all our guests have in common is that despite their great success, they've encountered many enormous challenges. So what were these challenges and how did they overcome them? That is what we are going to be talking about here. My name is Aldo de Pap and I'm massively looking forward and very grateful you can join us in this journey. So sit back, relax and download the podcast here. Now, it's now time to look at the billions of dollars that have been spent around the world in, in low and medium income countries and, and ask the question, has it worked? Yeah. And the answer is it hasn't worked. We have to do something different. And for me, it's almost uh, stakeholders really accepting this awful truth that seven out of 10 children aged 10, these are World Bank statistics, are in learning poverty. Yeah. Now, this is in spite of billions of dollars being spent. Hello, hello, everyone. A very, very warm welcome to yet another episode of the Teach Pitch podcast, particularly episode 29. My next guest is the founder and CEO of an organization called One Billion. Their URL is onebillion.org. And this is an organization that focuses on ensuring that one billion children in this world will be able to numerate and to read in their own language. So giving children who currently have no access to quality education, giving them access to such a thing so they can thrive, can build towards a better future for themselves. So you can imagine that already this person who goes by the name of Andrew Ash is a hero because he's focusing on something so vital, so profound and so important for this world that you know, already big kudos to him. Now, I'm not the only one who has given Andrew kudos. So don't take my word for it. Take the word, the promise of people like Elon Musk, Larry Page, Ariana Huffington, and all these other famous names, uh, because they have awarded Andrew Ash in 2019 with the X Prize. Now, the X Prize is a tremendous grant given to people who do exceptional things. And Andrew, with his organization, One Billion, is doing exceptional things. A great number of countries doing it for many, many, many children in this world and doing it so well and so profoundly. It goes without saying that he is worth your time and attention to listen into this interview. The X Prize, by the way, was a prize of $15 million, so one five, fifteen million million, and that's a whole lot of money that was given to Andrew in 2019. And uh, we're talking about this organization receiving the prize and the growth of the organization after getting that uh, grant money, but, but also uh, where they're different, uh, what their approach is. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, a, it was a really great conversation, again, not because One Billion is, is a great organization, because also Andrew is a great guy. He's a former teacher. He has a lucidity in his speaking and in his talking, a calmness that is contagious, and also this way of not compromising, making sure that the quality of uh, what his organization delivers is there and that he is not distracted or faded from his path. I had the honor of doing the interview with him. And then coincidentally, we also shared a taxi on our way back from the conference venue where the World Innovation Summit for Education took place and then, and then going back to the hotel. So we also had a really pleasant conversation after that because he spoke to me about his journey and how he geared everything up 
working from the London area and I'm building an organization as great, as promising and as massive as One Billion is. So I very much hope you enjoyed this conversation called the XPRIZE winner, Andrew Ash, CEO and founder of One Billion. This episode of the Teach Pitch podcast was recorded at the World Innovation Summit for Education, WISE, in Doha on December 9, 2021. We are extremely grateful to the Qatar Foundation and WISE team who supported and sponsored us in bringing this together. More information about the WISE Summit can be found on their website, wise-qatar.org. Thanks a lot, WISE. The 10th edition of the World Innovation Summit for Education has begun here in Doha, uh, in Qatar. Of course, it's, it's, it's taken place in person, uh, but also lots to do online through a dedicated digital uh, platform. And over the next uh, few days, we will be hearing from education leaders, policymakers, innovators and practitioners. We just opened with a, a, a beautiful uh, opening session, Wendy Kopp is the Wise Prize Laureate uh, 2021 for Teach for All. And we've had a great panel coming, opening the discussion, uh, making us think really about how we can unmute the next generation so we can really make sure that education is theirs. And I'm very fortunate here to be with Andrew Ash. Andrew Ash is the founder of One Billion. And that is an amazing organization. And I'm very happy right after the opening session to be sitting down here with Andrew um, to talk about WISE, but also to talk a little bit about uh, One Billion. Andrew, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you. It's a, it's a joy to be with you. <laughs> it, really great to have you. And, and, and let, let's first start with your thoughts on Wendy Kopp becoming the WISE Prize Laureate. Well, I think it was just wonderful to see Wendy up on the stage and talking about Teach First. I mean, I think she's an inspiration to all of us with her vision and drive and, uh, you know, all that she has accomplished in so many countries. So, uh, you know, it, it was such a wonderful thing to see her yeah. receiving the award. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, definitely well-deserved. One thing that stuck with me is whereby she said, like, it's a long game. And, and I 100% agree with her also trying to make a difference in education. Would you agree? Yes, I think... The theme of this conference is unmuting, the, those voices that aren't heard. And it, it is a long game, and we've got to listen to the voices of children. I mean, one billion that I work with, they, um, one billion work with the 70% of children defined by the World Bank as, as not able to read at age 10. This is a crisis in the world. We've all got to be innovative and looking forward to what the future looks like for education. And I suppose the message I would say that has come out so strongly today is how can we listen to the voices, the voices of the seven out of 10 children in low and medium income countries that cannot read? Their voices are very, very quiet and we've got to find a way of amplifying those voices and and you know an event like this in doha at wise is is doing that and you know i'm, I'm delighted with the theme of uh, of the wise conference unmuting those voices yeah. it's it's very befitting uh, also with the work that you are doing because uh, you know one billion is an incredible organization i really love it how you seemingly simplify something as huge as bringing numeracy and literacy to countries where there's practically none but also being so successful in scaling it all up through the use of uh, software and technology and applying that in the right way. Because it's one thing to talk about that in theory, but also it's another thing to really get it out there and making it successful. And One Billion is, is, is clearly an example, a successful example of that. You've managed to really deliver on genuine sustainable learning outcomes for these very quiet voices, as you'd say. So my hat's off to you. I also love the, the one in everything. So you have one billion, but I believe you have the one tap, one course. So it's kind of a recurring theme. So it's lovely. And, and I want to dive into all the great work that you're doing. Most notable, and I, I wanted to, to, to make sure that, that everyone knows that, is that you won an, an amazing prize, which is the X Prize in 2019. 
I read that thousands of children with no formal education were given tablets to test the five analyst software solutions that were in the running for the prize. Over a period of 15 months, that was all evaluated and assessed, and you came out as the winner. And then I read, and I hope I read that correctly, $15 million. Wow. <laughs> yes, well, uh, you know, thanks to Elon Musk as yeah. well for putting up the, uh, the prize money. Uh, the, the way it was evaluated was a, was a formal evaluation. So which group of children from the five finalists did the best in terms of learning outcomes? So these were children who are out of school mostly because they were too far away from a school to be able to get to school. And there are half a billion children like that around the world who are not in school. So what can we, as a community that's passionate about education, what can we do to unlock the talent of those children? So for me, in a way, the X Prize is, is testament to the ingenuity the creativity of those children if you can just give that little bit of a catalyst to children they will fly and we see children who their innate ability and their desire to reach their potential is at the heart of teaching mm. and we see children who are amazing if they're given a chance so what we believe at one billion is that EdTech can bring equity to the world. If you can give something to the child that allows them to develop, particularly the gift of reading. Now, you and I, we've both, we're lucky enough, by luck, of being born so that someone cared enough about us to teach us to read. Now, mm. if you're never given that chance, life is hard. You can't take control of your own learning. The possible directions you go are narrowed down. So we think that this learning crisis of, of seven out of 10 children in low and medium income countries, as defined by the World Bank, not being able to read, what can we, in, in our generation, what can we now do to address this problem, which is really a human right? It, yeah. it, it's the right of every child to learn to read. And we have to find new ways because the old ways are not working. Are not working, yeah. There's a lot in there, what you just said, that I would like to unwrap. Uh, one of the first things that I thought of is when you say a child, because you're active in so many countries, right? So Tanzania, sorry, could you, could you help me with the countries you, you're yeah, so, working in? So we believe in making, at our heart, we're a nonprofit publisher. We, we make software for children to read and mm -hmm. uh, running on a, on a tablet like this one, and we need to work where the child is. So there's maybe no electricity, there's no internet. So wow. we, we also provide a solar panel wow, yeah. um, so that we can work anywhere. We can work in a refugee camp, we can work where there's no internet, where there's no electricity. What we need is the enthusiasm of the child and that we have. The child yeah. will learn if they've given the chance, but we have to work in the child's own language. So we started in Malawi, Malawi. and that's uh, in Chichewa, the, lang the Chichewa language. Um, we've, we now have Swahili for Kenya, for Tanzania. We also have um, made our software in, in French for Central and West Africa. Mm. And we're just now completing Portuguese for Mozambique. So we it's not just a translation. We have to work with the local university, with the experts in the country. So it, it takes us at the moment about eight months to make a, a new language. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we've got a long list of ones we would like to do, mm -hmm. but we believe that if it, that the software has to be relevant to the child, it has to be contextualized. We have to work with the teachers and the experts in each country because uh, they know their children, they know what's best yeah. for their children. And we see this as a collaboration between us and um, experts in the community. Yeah. And uh, we have 
passionate people who've worked with us to make the software in these different languages. So we're in Malawi. We, we just had some research uh, completed in Sierra Leone. We worked in Tanzania, uh, about to start working in Ghana and Uganda. So these are with children who are on the margins. So these are children who are often left behind. We, we often hear about work being done with uh, secondary school or tertiary education, but we believe that the, we've got to get a strong foundation and the strong foundation is reading and numeracy. If we can get those right, the child will take, um, take control of their own learning. So this is an absolutely a fundamental, it's a, it's a must. It's yeah. what we've got to, uh, I mean, the World Bank has said literacy and numeracy has to be at the heart. Yeah. So one of the things, because you know, my questions are a lot around localization. You just mentioned language. Yeah? You, you you say it's, it takes eight months to work with a, a a local team on the ground to to, to grow it. Is there anything more needed than just? kind of the translation, because I can imagine it needs to adhere to a certain curriculum. You need to have support of local partners. It needs to be signed off by the government. I mean, it sounds like quite an exercise. It, it, it is quite an exercise. Yeah. Uh, and now, it's important. Who do we work for at One Billion? Well, our customer is the child. So yeah. the child learning to read. Now, fortunately, the curriculum in every country, you, you have to learn certain sub-skills to learn to read. You need to learn... Uh, Letters make words, that words, uh, uh, letters make sounds, phonics, and you go on a progression to, uh, um, for reading with comprehension. Now, what is our goal? Our goal is not just that a child can read, but we want a child to read. We want the child to have a love of reading. Mm -hmm. Now, this is different in different uh, uh, for example, we start off with uh, introducing letters, but it's different in English to Chichewa. Yeah. Chichewa, the language in Malawi, is a very syllabic language. So it's very easy to read. If I showed you a piece of Chichewa, you would be able to read it hmm. and you would be quite accurate reading it because it's so phonetic, but you wouldn't understand it. So yeah. reading on its own is not enough. We no. have to have comprehension. And we have to have reading. The child needs to have a love of reading yeah. so that they can read for enjoyment. They can read for their own learning. Yeah. And we sometimes hear discussions that, that second best might be good enough for the child. Well, we don't subscribe to that. We, we think that ed tech, if done really well, can bring equity. One of the exciting things we've had is from a couple of university randomized control trials is that we know that there's a gender bias um, in all of us, in countries in, in the UK, in, in America, in Africa, all over the world, that the boys tend to do better than girls at, at maths. Mm. It's all over the world. But one of the really exciting things we've seen is that if you give boys and girls an identical input with carefully designed ed tech software in their own language, the gender differences are removed. Oh, wow. And this has been borne out by studies in Malawi and in Sierra Leone. And we have to sort of accept it. Society has different expectations and there is a bias that society brings in to the way children are taught. Yeah. If you can remove that bias, yeah, then you get this exactly yeah. the same results for both boys and girls. So we think that ed tech can bring equity. Yeah. And ed tech, can, if you can get it right, it's hard to get it right, mm -hmm. but it can scale. If we made a great school somewhere, it's very hard to scale a wonderful school. Yeah. But if, it's a big if, but if you can get ed tech to deliver these basic skills of reading and numeracy, it is possible to scale. Scale yeah. is at the heart of, of, of the this problem. Of yeah. With scale, because from your website, I gathered that 167,171 children have benefited from learning through 1 billion. Uh, which is an, a very impressive number. 
Um, I really like how you've mentioned that on your site, and, and I, I think it's, it's, it's the way to go because you continuously are asked to quantify things and to show kind of what impact is. So metrics are very important. We need to be talking about those metrics. But you just mentioned something around the tension of quality of edtech versus that skill, right? Because, you know, giving a device to someone, that's not what you're doing. No, you're giving the device and you're making sure that, that a child has a joy for reading further down so that it's really ingrained within the child so they can further take that on. How, how do you deal with the tension between quality on one hand and then and then kind of the push for impact on the other or the push for for scale and metrics so i think for us the, the, the way i would describe it is don't settle don't settle for second best mm -hmm. yeah. the most precious thing is the child's time and we've got to see the child's time as being invaluable yeah uh, um what does the child deserve in terms of ed tech the best or the second best. Yeah. We are striving to make our content in Chichewa, in Swahili, with the working with the government, the best it can possibly be. Now, if there's something better comes along, we have to be prepared to stand back and let something else um, deliver to the child. Yeah. Now, one of the things where we think it goes wrong with so many um, implementations of education is they're not ambitious enough. We have words like, uh, through our intervention, we will improve teacher training or yeah. we will improve learning. Now, the word improve is not a strong word. It's, yeah. it's a word you can say, oh, I succeeded with very little results. So yeah. we've got to um, raise the bar massively higher. We don't say, uh, oh, we want to just improve by uh, 10% because the standards are so low at the moment in yeah. so many countries that we need a transformation. Yeah. So it, it's up to all of us not to settle. So yeah. those are the two words I, I'd say I is don't settle. I think that's beautiful. And I 100% I agree, but you're giving yourself an enormous challenge there because you know, which milestones or which targets do you give yourself then if, if, if you say there's practically nothing? And also, you must be dealing with lots of local stakeholders, eh, lo local partners. I can imagine it's difficult to, to stay in communication with them and to make sure they think about this in the same way as you do. So how do you do that vetting uh, process okay. exactly? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I'm glad you noticed we're, we're one course, one tab, one we have used the word one. And yeah. of course, we're called one billion because yeah. uh, 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 and that's keeps reminding us that our focus is on a child but also on the one billion children that can't read so yeah. we're focused on on that now how do we measure so if you work in africa or in in, uh, in different parts of the world there is a standard test used called egra which is egra where everyone loves acronyms early yeah. grade reading assessment it's a one-to-one -one test from a an assessor to a child which is expensive and difficult to administer so we've just brought out um what we call one test which allows us to measure where the child is on their reading journey from uh, learning letters to uh, to phonic sounds to whole words to sentence recognition and we're just about to embark on validating it against other tests and we've had some funding from uh, cisco foundation to allow us to do that now this is very important because it keeps us honest it's yeah. no good too often organizations don't really examine the impact they're doing yeah. and we've got to be open that We've got to keep checking ourselves. Are we delivering value yeah. for the child? And yeah. the reason I come back to this, the, the child over and over again, is the problem with capitalism is that where there's no market, capitalism or commercial companies or commercial publishers, it does not work. If you're working for the hundreds of millions of children whose family income is a dollar a day, there is no commercial model that will sustain that. So yeah. the commercial publishers, they have to make a profit for their shareholders. But if yeah. there's no profit to be made, it then is down to the 
what we would say is the important non-profit sector. Yeah. So we're a non-profit publisher. Uh, and we don't have financial goals, but we do have goals of making very significant learning outcomes for children. Yeah. But we have to measure that. So yeah. it's no good just having that as a goal. We need to be challenged on that. Yeah. Is it delivering for the child? Yeah. So we have to measure it. So we've now developed a a test which uh, uh, which we will have validated in, in 2022, hopefully in the first half independently and we will then be able to use that as a metric of where the child is how they progress on their journey to reading and the journey is to a love of reading so that the child can then has the autonomy to take over their own uh, their their own journey their uh, you know we we all you, you know even all of us now if we want to you know, mend something or do something, we turn to YouTube, we read things on the web. And um, these children, this is unlocking their own ability to learn. Yeah. And if you can't read, it's very difficult journey yeah. for a child. Yeah, no, yeah, no, I can imagine an incredibly difficult journey. So uh, again, my hat's off to you for for bringing that so close to the child, not only as a, as you say, like a gimmick, because you hear lots of stories about giving a tablet to a child but then you don't really hear a lot about the follow-up and how that leads to sustainable learning outcomes and you know what's next you know when that is there so uh, it's, it's really refreshing to hear a story about we bring the tablet to a child we understand the local circumstances of the child with you know with, with all that the, the your tablet has to offer but also we follow up and we evaluate and, and really are focused on the child being a client. So I just wanted to reiterate, I think that's a beautiful philosophy and a beautiful vision to build upon. I often interview people about challenges. Now, we've, we've already discussed quite a few, but what has been the biggest challenge in building One Billion? Okay, so some people won't agree with this, but the big challenge is the power of the status quo. And by that, there is a belief by many people that there is a route to education which we feel comfortable about ourselves. We had a, uh, uh, perhaps when we're lucky enough to go to a nice primary school, we remember our primary school teacher, we project something onto the solution which is based on our own, our own experience. Now, it's now time to look at the billions of dollars that have been spent around the world in, in low and medium income countries and, and ask the question, has it worked? Yeah. And the answer is it hasn't worked. We have to do something different. And for me, it's almost uh, the stakeholders really accepting this awful truth that seven out of 10 children aged 10, these are World Bank statistics, are in learning poverty. Yeah. Now, this is in spite of billions of dollars being spent. So yeah. th the starting point has to be, don't carry on in the same direction. We have to make a change. Yeah. Now, this change has to put the child at the center. Now, this is uncom an uncomfortable truth for many stakeholders who say, well, we, we've always done it a certain way, and if we did it just a bit better or perhaps we spent a bit more money on teacher training or we built a few more classrooms, but the trouble is that's been done over and over again and the results are not good enough. Not good enough. So yeah. the voice of the child is saying, teach me to read. I must learn to read. And we have to accept that the status quo is not acceptable. Yeah. So that's the biggest, uh, the biggest challenge, is to say, what can we do differently now? And we feel that, um, that many organizations see that they're very happy for their own children to have access to new technology, but they somehow, for some reason, they, they feel that that's not acceptable for the most marginalized children. But actually, we want the best for the child, not second best. Yeah. So I think this is at the heart of where we as one billion are going. We, we want to see 
the child at the center yeah. and we want the uh, all of us to uh, including ourselves to come with great humility that the existing solutions are not delivering yeah. and we need to think differently we need to think differently so so in growing one billion were you at a point where as you said before like okay we're doing it wrong did you ever come to such an internal conclusion and that you say guys we need to revisit this you know throw away what we've had and start again is that, a, yeah, is that yes the case? I, I think one of our strengths at one billion is we're prepared to rapidly change direction okay so yeah. we, we started off uh, we did our first experiments more than 20 years ago before tablets existed and we used um interactive um a portable dvd players where you interacted with the five buttons mm -hmm. and we learned something very rapidly that children were engaged children were motivated children would learn the technology did not deliver the the uh, the batteries uh, ran out too quickly the uh, the disc didn't like the heat or the or the dust but we learned from that experience so we've we've got to um we have to be prepared to test things and not uh, and, and change direction yeah. it's absolutely fundamental now edtech has had a bad press because we've seen massive experiments which have failed almost completely. Yeah. And we have to be honest about failure. And we have to be honest about our own failure. I mean, we're great believers in research. If you don't research something independently, it's all guesswork. Yeah. So we're very cautious of anyone that researches themselves, including, yeah. including us. So with our new assessment, we want the truth we will have it independently we'll be choosing a university to to research it and we will be telling them we want the truth if yeah. it doesn't deliver we we're the first that want to know yeah. now this is not a feature of many organizations including you know pharmaceutical companies they they want the evidence for their drug or whatever it yeah. is we we want to know if it doesn't deliver we want to know if it's second best yeah. so the child is the customer. Yeah. The child, we have to find ways of that child being excited and curious. The child wants to learn. Yeah. And th this statistic of after eight years at primary school, seven out of 10 children cannot read. Yeah. The check, we have to bring Nicholas. dramatic yeah. change yeah. now. And it's up to all of us to use research to find out what works and to be prepared to stop or change direction yeah. and we need to do it rapidly because yeah. before another generation of children yeah. um, miss out on on uh, being able to yeah. read going back to this number seven out of ten we of course live in very strange times with with the pandemic mm -hmm. do you think this number has worsened well yes before the pandemic if, if we uh, the world bank statistics on low-income countries was 89 percent of children in uh, countries as defined by the world bank as low income 89 percent of 10 year olds were in learning poverty now if you combined low low income and medium income it used to be 53 percent were in learning poverty but since the pandemic the world bank has just produced new statistics where that number has gone up by 17 percent now if you think what that means most countries in the in the world are low or medium income yeah. so this is a crisis for the world of yeah. that resource of its children who are yeah. not learning to read so we have to imagine a future yeah. where this most important resource of i mean what is a country's most precious resource it's not its oil it's not its gold or its diamonds the most important value most precious thing it has is its children yeah. and we need to find ways of these children learning to read yeah i'm getting signals here that we're that we're almost at the end but we could talk for hours yes Andrew. we could I have, indeed i have so yeah. many more yeah. questions to ask you yeah. i'm going to wrap up with what is next for <laughs> one billion what what are we going to talk about at wise 2023 i believe it's every two years so well, what it, do, okay I'll, very quickly i'll <laughs> answer that what is our goal it's to work with others in collaboration to work uh, and the goal is in our name one billion children now that's not us doing it so we encourage partnerships working so we can help and we can work with other organizations to reach this goal of 
one billion children. Yeah. I wish you all the best in doing that. My hat's off to you. Well deserved this X Prize. And I hope one billion successes uh, for you. Andrew Ash, thank you so, so very much uh, for your time. And I wish you a wonderful Y Summit uh, further down. And let's talk some more, but offline. So tune in to the WISE channel. We're here uh, throughout the entire event uh, for more WISE on air, conversations hosted uh, by myself, Aldo the Pub. And tomorrow there will be a discussion in Arabic led by a uh, language teacher, author and entrepreneur, Maha Yakub, also known as Learn Arabic with Maha on YouTube. And many more uh, great things to come uh, with a great team, uh, Carly here, Nandita and, and myself. Thank you uh, so uh, very much. Thanks, Aldo. Great okay. to see you. <laughs> You're welcome. If you liked this episode of the Teach Pitch podcast, then it would mean the absolute world if you could share it with your friends and or give it a short review on your preferred podcast platform. The more you share your ideas about these interviews, the more people will find out about them. So do let us know what you think. We'd be very, very grateful. Special thanks to Kevin McLeod for our beautiful theme music, La Grande Chase. This podcast was produced and edited by Natalie Piles. Project coordination by Inva Cheney.